John chapter 10, verses 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Interesting line. This charge I have received from my Father to lay down his life. And it's Memorial Day weekend, and I don't have per se a Memorial Day message in in a sense, but I do have a message that really fits the theme of this day um, very effectively. And I want to talk today, as we think about uh, Memorial Day weekend here, and as we think about this series of sermons we're in, how Jesus has the last word <coughs> on surrender. <coughs> Everything you want to know about surrender everything you've wanted to ever ask God about surrender, he will tell you, he will teach you, he will explain to you with his very life. And he's very clear in the Gospel of John here that while there was an arrest, while false trumped-up charges were filed, while there was a kangaroo court and a guilty verdict and a crucifixion sentence to follow, Jesus still makes the claim that no one took his life from him, but that he willingly laid it down, that he surrendered his life on your behalf and my behalf and he did it under the charge that the Father had given him to do that. Now, in this series of sermons and we ended last week really with the seventh and final saying that Jesus uh, spoke from the cross when he was being crucified and we've used these to look at how Jesus has the last word on a variety of issues, sin, salvation, satisfaction, forgiveness, death and life, relationships, And today, this idea of surrender. And as I was thinking about this series of messages, I thought, now, is there anything else you want me to say? I was kind of praying about this with the Lord, and he gave me really what I thought was a really powerful insight, that there is actually an eighth thing that Jesus says from the cross. And there's, we know the seven that are real common, but there is an eighth thing that if we're not careful, we can miss it. And so let's look at the eighth thing that Jesus says from the cross here. In Matthew 27, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. That's an important phrase to keep in mind as we go forward this morning. But let God deliver him now if he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. And there's something very powerful that Jesus says in there, and we can kind of miss it. In fact, you can hear it a little more clearly if you go back to Isaiah, the prophetic tongue of the prophet Isaiah. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 53, 7. Here's what Jesus was just saying in that last passage. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So I want to talk to you today about the eighth thing that Jesus says from the cross, from the crucifixion, and that would be his silent word. That's that's what Jesus communicated through his sheer silence. And as they mocked him, and as they ridiculed him, and as they tore him apart, and as they made fun of him, and as they spit upon him, like a lamb led before the slaughterhouse, he just remained silent. And I thought, what? What an incredibly powerful thought. He never fired back. He never defended himself. He never retaliated retaliated he just absorbed it all the physical pain the emotional pain the spiritual pain he just absorbed it all he took it all and embraced it and and he knew i think jesus just understood that he had to embrace the cross there was no way around the cross but he had to just simply hang on the cross and take whatever the cross threw at him whatever that meant he knew he had to bear it and so he doesn't even 
respond. In fact, here's the thing that's really interesting about this is that of all the things he says on the cross that are quite powerful and quite significant, like it is finished, that's a pretty powerful statement. This may be the most powerful thing that he says on the cross is just what he communicates through his sheer silence. In fact, listen to Mark chapter 14. This is in the pre-crucifixion buildup. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. And so he, here's why Pilate was shocked because usually when you're, you think you're innocent like Jesus thought he was innocent and he gave this demeanor that he was innocent. I mean, Pilate looked at him and thought, this guy's probably innocent. He seems to be innocent. I can't find anything against him. And yet Jesus didn't respond, didn't retaliate, didn't fire back, didn't defend himself against all the charges that were made. And Pilate was amazed. And I think this is maybe one of the most powerful things, maybe the most powerful thing that Christ says on the cross, the fact that he simply says nothing. Most people will vehemently defend themselves if they're in Jesus' shoes, but not Jesus. So the question this morning then is twofold. And um, his silent word was possibly his most powerful word on the cross there. What he said through his sheer silence and communicated through saying nothing. Here's the two questions then today. Really, what was Jesus saying through his silent surrender? What was he saying to you and me? What was he communicating through the silence of his surrender as he hangs on that cross and takes not just a physical beating, but an emotional beating? And, and he hears all the criticism and all the mocking and all the, um, just, just all the harsh words. And then I guess, what can that teach me about my own surrender? when I think about what I can learn from my own surrender by watching the surrender of Christ upon the cross. So I have three observations today or three things that I think Jesus communicates to us and there's maybe more we could come up with but there are three really key things I think that we can relate back to our own life and our own surrender in our own relationship with God and with each other. And here's the first thing he tells us, I love you more than words can say. So when he hangs on the cross and says absolutely nothing, it's because he's saying, I love you, and there are just not the right words, there's not enough words to express how much I love you. You know, we kind of have that problem when you think about it. When we want to tell God how much, how great he is, we want to worship him, it's really hard for us to find the adequate words to really worship him for who he really is. We do the best we can. But hanging on the cross, Jesus says, I love you more than words can ever say. John chapter 15, this is my commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. And here's the deal. It's one thing to tell someone you love them. It's another thing to show them. It's another thing to show them that you love them, rather than just telling them. It's Memorial Day weekend. And we have a lot of people who can say they love their country. There are people that would say, I would die for my country. And then there are those that actually go out and do die for their country. Big difference between what we say and what we actually do. And I don't think we spend enough time reflecting on the sacrifice that men and women make for our country. For every fallen soldier, there's there's a mom or a dad. There may be a husband or a wife. There may be a son or a daughter. There's friends, there's people behind that fallen soldier that lost a loved one that are still living with that loss. And we never really probably spend enough time reflecting, really. Memorial Day is a great day off work, a great day of cooking out and vacation. Do we really take the time to stop and reflect on what the holiday really, really is? It's one thing to say you love your country. It's another thing to actually die for it. And that speaks volumes. It really does. And Jesus' death on the cross speaks volumes about his love for you and me. Me, In fact, listen to Romans chapter 5. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. 
But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So you got a person here that's a pretty decent person. Most people aren't going to die for him. you got someone over here that is just really exceptional. Some people, well, they may die for him. But when we were scum, <laughs> Christ died for us. And um, that's the amazing reality of his great love for us, the depth of his love for us, that he died for us when we were sinners. He loved us that deeply. Why did he love us so deeply? Number one, he created us. Number two, he gave us life. Number three, his intent was always to be in a relationship with us. The fact is he knows everyone that's ever been conceived, he knows them by name. He knows them by their DNA. He knows them, here's the truth, God knows you better than you know yourself, and he loves you more than you love yourself. In fact, we're all, we've all been there. There's all times we don't like ourselves for who we are or for a behavior or something. We just don't like ourselves. We don't like who we are. You know, God never stops liking us and God never stops loving us. <clears throat> and he went to the cross and he died for us. Pretty powerful stuff. Now consider the application a moment of how this impacts our own life when you think about Jesus' great love for us and his surrender. Look at 1 Peter 2, and I want you to see this, and I mentioned this earlier as a very important phrase in today's sermon. It says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Let me just say, there are lots of verses in Scripture that talk about Jesus just being silent and taking what was given to him. Pretty amazing. And when he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And that's the key. That's, that's how he endured the cross. He just continually trusted the Father, trusting God who judges justly. And how does this connect up with you and I then? How, how, does, how, how does his surrender on the cross, because of his great love for us, how does that impact my own life and my own surrender? Well, think of it this way. Just as Jesus trusted the one who judges justly, we can trust the one who loves us deeply. We can trust someone who loves us so much <clears throat> that they would hang on the cross when we were so undeserving. That they would save us when we're so unworth saving. We can trust someone who loves us that deeply. Just as Jesus trusted the one who judges justly, we can trust the one who loves us so incredibly deeply. Our trust in God's love silences our fear. That's simply the reality in life. As I trust in God's, in God's love, it silences the fear that I have in life. And I can fully surrender to a God who loves me like that. We only have to look to the cross to see the depth of God's love, to see what words could never express. Here's the reality. Does God ask a lot for us today? Does God want a lot from us? He wants us to totally surrender our lives to Him. But here's the beauty of it. He went first. He surrendered everything for you and I first before He ever asked us to surrender anything to Him. His surrender precedes our own. Interesting little uh, article here. According to one story, which may be a legend, and this is about the phrase, Skin in the game, the origin of this phrase, the skin in the game. According to one story, which may be a legend, in the late 1960s, the now iconic investor Warren Buffett pried uh, seed money for his very first stock fund from 11 doctors who'd agreed to kick in $105,000. Then, in a symbolic act of his own commitment, Buffett added $100 of his own money to the kitty. No one knows exactly when the phrase skin in the game entered the American lingo, but many pinned it on Buffett's willingness to plunk down his own hundred dollars. The now common phrase captures the essence of an investment of heart and courage and risk, not the mere investment of money. The idea is simple. You have no business asking others to trust you with their money if you're not willing to put your own resources at risk. If you have no skin in the game, no stake of vulnerability, then your engagement is distant and rhetorical rather than personal and visceral. We might play fast and loose with others' resources, but not with our own. Put another way, it's one thing to work for an entrepreneur. It's quite another to be the entrepreneur. The first involves little personal investment, the second demands our heart, our time, our sacrifice, 
our commitment some real skin. And we can say that Jesus, when he went to the cross, he invested in this whole thing called surrender. Before you and I were ever asked to surrender, he put his own skin in the game. He laid his own life on the line for you and I. So what was Jesus saying through his silent surrender? And what can I learn about my own surrender? As he silently surrendered, what was he teaching us? Here's the second thing. I'll show to you a better way. First, he says, I love you more than words can say. Second thing he tells us is, I'm showing to you a better way. There is a better way to live life, a better way to do life, a better way to approach life. Think about this idea of surrender and the gospel, and and just think about this reality how the secret to the gospel really is surrender. Listen to back in John chapter 15. And I don't think I wanted that scripture on there actually, so we'll just, we read that a moment ago. But the secret to the gospel really is surrender. There would be no good news without the surrender of Christ on the cross. If he had not surrendered himself, there would be no good news today. So the secret to the gospel really is surrender. And Jesus exemplifies to us in the gospel the significance of surrender. Now we read a moment ago in 1 Peter about how Christ didn't answer back, but he just simply entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Back in 1 Peter. Let's read that passage again in its broader context. And just listen to this passage. Fascinating. Servants. That could be you and I. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one who endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Going on. For to you... For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He surrendered his life for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. What a powerful passage. And we see here that when Jesus was silently surrendering his life, what he was doing was giving us a vibrant and colorful example of what it looks like for you and me to surrender our lives as well to Christ to surrender our lives to our own cross, to surrender our lives to one another. Now, what exactly did Jesus surrender on the cross? Think about it. What did he surrender? And we could come up with a a lot of things worth weighing out when we think about exactly what he surrendered. But think about, here's a few things that Jesus surrendered on the cross that we can relate with. Um, Surrendering your your life is, is surrendering your will, your agenda, your comfort. All those things we could say that Christ surrendered when he went to the cross. He surrendered his will, his agenda, his comfort. And that's what it means to surrender our life. That's what Christ exemplifies for us. But even more than that, there is one thing on the cross that the cross really captures. That the cross really says that this is one thing we all need to be able to surrender. And, and the cross proves it so powerfully. Christ proves it so powerfully. One of the most powerful and transformative areas of surrender is when we surrender our rights. It's surrendering our rights. And if you think of Christ on the cross, you can think of all the rights that he willingly and silently surrendered. What rights did Jesus surrender at the cross? He surrendered, for instance, his right to his wealth. He left the glories of heaven and all the riches in heaven and surrendered them all to come to this earth. And he didn't even have a home or a bed, it says. His right to be served. He's the king of kings. And he comes down and he does the serving rather than being served. He gave up his right to be comfortable. 
again leaving behind heaven and all of its comforts for this cold, dark, sin-infested world. His right to his good reputation. They mocked him there at the cross. They, they brought these trumped-up charges against him and he just didn't respond. His right to his good reputation, his right to his holiness and purity as he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Think about how that would be. One who was holy and perfect and had never known sin bore our sins in his body on the tree. All the rights that Jesus surrendered at the cross. What an amazing thing to stop and think about. All of the rights that he gave up for you. Now, someone might say, well, yeah, he, gave, he did give up those rights, but he gave them up temporarily. He was going to get them back, and he knew that. And that's true, it's very true, but that same logic can be applied to you and I. <clears throat> that we may give up rights today. <clears throat> Excuse me. We may give up rights today, but believe me, when we go into heaven, into eternity with, with God, with Christ, we'll get everything back and then some. God will make all those, he'll restore all those things that uh, we have surrendered. We'll, we'll, we'll more than get uh, a return on those investments. We simply will. We surrender our rights just like Christ, his example, and we trust the one who judges justly and knows that, know that in eternity he will more than repay us. Think about our own life then. Think about the things that we can give up. We can surrender our rights to make our relationship stronger. Just think of that one area. Surrendering in our, can, can do amazing things in our life, but when we think about surrendering our rights, one area it really impacts is our relationships. And just here's some examples. Surrendering the right to be first. Surrendering the right to be appreciated. If you think, no one's noticing what I'm doing and how much I'm giving. and Surrendering the right sometimes to be hurt. Surrendering the right to be bitter. Surrendering the right to an apology. Well, they owe me an apology. Surrendering the right to defend ourselves. Surrendering the right to be right. We can lay all those rights down. You take a relationship with two people and they're both surrendering like that, you will have one amazing relationship. You take a relationship where one is surrendering like that and one isn't, it won't be quite as healthy a relationship. But for yourself, it'll be healthy. You'll never more like Christ than when you're surrendering your rights, when you're laying down your rights and just saying, I'm following the example of Christ on the cross. He gave me the example. He did it for me first. And I am simply trusting him, the one who judges justly. Now, how, how does this, again, how do we apply this to our life? How does this really work out in our life? It, it's really simple. It's that word trust again. It goes back. He set the example. We are, to, we are just as he entrusted the one who judges justly, we need to do the same thing with our own life. We simply need to do the same thing with our own life. Our trust in God's example answers our objections. So any objections I have, if I object to not being heard, if I object to, to not being able to defend myself, if I object uh, to not being hurt, if I object to these things, when I trust the example of Christ, it makes all the difference. When I simply say, I'm going to trust your example on the cross, that you know a better way to do life, that, that this is a better way than being bitter, than holding grudges, than being unforgiving, than having to be first or having to have my own way. When I say there's a better way than all that, and I trust in his example, it will answer all of my examples. There's a fascinating story. Listen to this story. <clears throat> this comes from Open Doors USA. Uh, they serve the persecuted church worldwide. This goes back about 13 years ago. I never heard this story before, but Kelly Callahan, she's the prayer and courier uh, coordinator for Open Doors, shares this powerful story. Listen to this <coughs> story about a Chinese village and how they, how they allowed evangelism to bring social order. Listen to this. According to Open Doors Ministry, Chinese government officials became so fed up with the sky-high rates of crime, drug addiction, and sickness in the country of Lankan Lahu, uh, Yunnan province, that in the mid-1990s they turned for help to the only model citizens in the area, the Christians. 
We had to admit that the Lahu people were a dead loss because of their addiction to opium, confessed an official who did not want to be named. Their addiction made them weak and sick. Then they would go to one of their priests who required animal sacrifices of such extravagance that the people became poor. And because they were so poor, they stole from each other and law and order deteriorated. It was a vicious cycle that no amount of government propaganda could break. We noticed, however, that in some villages <coughs> in the country, the Lahu were prosperous and peace-loving. There was no drug problem or any stealing or social order problems. Households had a plentiful supply of pigs, oxen, and chickens. So we commissioned a survey to find out why these villages were different. To our astonishment and embarrassment, we discovered the key factor was that these villages had a majority of Christians. Officials launched a daring experiment in 1998, the likes of which would have been unthinkable in China 10 years previous. They sponsored Christians to go into the troublesome villages and share their faith. They started by picking out the worst village which had 240 people, 107 of which were hopelessly addicted to opium. Christians, uh, Christian Lahus were bussed into the village at government expense and the villagers were herded together by the police and made to listen to the testimonies of the Christians. A year later, there were 17 converts in the village and they began to grow rich because they stopped spending money on drugs. Eight of the 17 converts even had enough money to uh, own sewing machines and start small businesses. By early 2002, 83 of the villagers were Christians and the prosperity had spread. The government officials said, we were delighted with the results and have been extending the tactic to many other villages since then. Fascinating story. And it evidently hasn't spread to all of China widespread. But there's a better way. And it's the way of Christ and it's the example that he gave us on the cross. You want to transform your own relationships, transform your own existence, transform your own world, your own community. Follow the example of Christ on the cross and silently surrender to God and to his will. The fact is even the world can recognize there is a better way. When the light of Christ shines into the darkness, while it exposes evil, it also shows the beauty of Christ. It shows that there is a better way than the evil way, a more desirable way. In fact, given the opportunity, the light of Christ will overcome the darkness and the beauty of Christ will transform the ugliness of the evil all around us. That's what happened when Christ surrendered on the cross. That's what can happen in your life and my life. What was Jesus saying through his silent surrender? And what can that teach me about my own surrender? He's teaching to me, number one, he loves me more than words can say and that he's showing to me a much, much, much better way to do life. And number three, he's telling us this, I offer you what money cannot buy. When he went to the cross and silently surrendered, he's saying, I have an offer for you. I'm making you an offer, an offer that money cannot buy. An offer of hope for despair, of righteousness for evil, of death for life. On the cross, Jesus Christ made us all an offer. He just did. He made an offer to every single individual. That's the message of the cross, that there are some things money can't buy, but there's this offer he 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 has given to us. Now, I want us to see exactly what this offer is this morning that Christ makes to us, but here's the deal. Understand this first. If we can't purchase this offer, if God has an offer for us, and we'll see this offer in three different ways, But if we can't purchase this offer, uh, how do we acquire it? How do we receive this offer? Well, a couple words would come into play. First would be that idea of trust or faith. We've talked about Jesus Christ who trusted the one who judges justly. And he trusted. And we understand for for you and I, there's an element of faith that we are going to put our faith and trust in Christ. And the other word that, that goes along with that then is the word surrender. Because surrender is also the other aspect of how we receive this incredible offer. Again, we've kind of said this earlier, but surrender is central to making the gospel work. Surrender is central to making the gospel work. The gospel hinges on surrender. It really does. 
Here's the offer he makes to, to us. Let's look at this offer a minute. Let's start here, though, in 1 Peter 1. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Without defect or blemish. The empty way of life. That's what we're all born into. We're all born into that empty way of life. It's what most adults grow up into, a life of emptiness, a life without purpose, a life apart from their creator, Christ. Peter says, though, that those who are saved or redeemed from this empty way of life, those who find their meaning and joy and purpose in Christ, money has nothing to do with it. Jesus could not buy us. He had to die for us. And he purchased us not with money and with gold and with silver, but with his very own life, with his precious, precious blood. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And again, we see that word that Jesus is the life many times. We just, we kind of limit that contextually to our salvation, that the only way to heaven and the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ and he is the life. And that's all very true. But understand that the, the term, the life there, goes beyond our salvation. It, it encompasses so much more. It encompasses our daily existence. It encompasses this offer that Christ has for us in its totality of all that God has for us when it comes to this life. So what's this offer? A, he offers us a the life of Christ. That's the first part of this offer. And we understand the life of Christ. This, this is our salvation. He simply offers us his life for our life. And when you think about it, our life, we're dead. We're spiritually dead. And he is, of course, fully alive. And what a great transaction that is when he will trade his, he, he, he was all full of life for us who are really dead. And so the first part of this offer is his life for our life or his life for really our death. And it's an amazing thing when you think about it. And I want you to understand here, I want you to see how surrender is central to the gospel and surrender is central to this offer that God is making to you and I. And so we understand this life that he offers us, this life, remember, he didn't buy it. He, he purchased it with his, with his very own blood, with his very own life. When he surrendered to the cross, he was making the life possible for you and me. That's simply the reality. Christ surrendered to purchase our redemption and to redeem us from the empty way of life. Surrender is central to the gospel, to my enjoying the life of Christ. Surrender is central. But here's the beautiful thing about it, is this works, this works in both directions because it also works on my end because I surrender to receive my salvation and enjoy the full life. We oftentimes can argue about the semantics of salvation and what exactly do you have to pray and what exactly do you have to believe and you know what it really comes down to? I mean, there are certain things we have to believe or understand that Jesus is God and that he died for my sins but you know what salvation really is? It's, hard. it's just I wave the white flag and I surrender and I say, you know what? I give up trying to save myself. I give up trying to be good enough. I can't. There's nothing I can do. I, I surrender, I give up. I, I recognize you did it all for you paid the price for me, you did it all for me, I'm just, I, I surrender. When it comes to this full life, there's nothing I can do to earn it. I just have to surrender and fully, that word again, faith, trust, and trust the one who judges justly, the one who will look at me if I put my faith in Christ and judge my sins forgiven, judge my sins covered by the blood of Christ who will judge me righteous and holy and pure in Christ. So I surrender to receive my salvation and enjoy the full life. I cannot earn that. And the other thing you can't do and most of the world tries to do today really is that when it comes to the full life I can't earn it but I also, I also can't buy it. 
People, we try really hard today to, to buy our way into happiness or to buy our way out of unhappiness and, and it just doesn't work. No amount of money can make you happy. Nothing can, can fulfill the emptiness in your life but Christ. And really, salvation really is when I simply surrender and I bow my knee and I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who did it all for me and I just trust him. <clears throat> surrender is central to the gospel on both ends of the spectrum. Second part of the offer that he gives us is the gift of worship. So this, this idea of the, that Christ comes along and he says, I'm offering you something and money can't buy what I'm offering you but I'm offering you the gift of worship. Now, I want you to think about something about worship here because there is something about worship we don't often think about when it comes to our life. We often don't think about worship in this sense. How many knew that worship has a dark side? How many knew that worship can be destructive? Did you know that? How many ever thought that worship can actually be destructive? And you probably hear that and you think, now, wait a minute, how can worship be destructive? How can worship have a dark side? But it can. There is a dark, worship is a gift, but worship also has a dark side. What is the dark side to worship? It's real simple. Worship is a gift intended to make us stronger. That is unless our worship is in the wrong place. And we have people today who worship their cars or they worship their kids or they worship the cottage up north or they worship their 401k or they worship their career, or they worship themselves, or, you know, if your worship's in the wrong place, worship's not a gift. It's a curse. It's a destructive thing in your life. And Christ hangs on the cross and says, I have something I'm offering you, the gift of worship, and you can't purchase this. I purchased it with my own life when I hung on the cross. I purchased it with my own blood. You can't buy it. You can only have it as you surrender to me. And all those things that we want to worship, yeah, you surrender them to me. Like that rich young ruler, sell everything you have, give it all away, come follow me. If you're worshiping those things, surrender them to me and I'll give you the gift of worship. When we learn to worship Christ 24-7 in our life, that will be a life of security, a life of, of satisfaction, a life that we have just never believed was possible. He offers us the life of Christ. He offers us the gift of worship. And then he offers us, thirdly, the hope of purpose. He hangs on the cross and he says, again, I have something for you. Money can't buy this. But you can have this if if you're willing to surrender. Follow my example. There's a better way. It's called surrender. And if you surrender, I will give you the hope of of purpose. This begs a very significant question. What or who do you live for? What or who do you live for today? I mean, you, you think about what people live for today in the world. Some people live for the, some people live for noble things. Some people live for things that I think are a little goofy, but you got people that, you know, <clears throat> you got people that live for the environment and they're going to save the world from humans. We're going to destroy the earth and they're here to save the environment. That's what their life revolves around. You got others that uh, uh, they live for the inner city. They want to make the inner cities a better place for families and kids. And, and, and there's others that live for the marginalized and the poor and the abused, like a Mother Teresa. There are those that live for their country and they sacrifice their life for their country. There are noble things we can live for. There are things that are maybe... Don't make as much sense. But here's the deal. Here's what Scripture says. You and I, we can live our lives for the souls of men and women. We can live for an eternal reason. And each person ever been, that's been born or conceived, God knows them. He knows them by their DNA. Knows them by the name that he has for them. And we can live for their eternal soul to help them find Christ, to help them understand the offer that's being made from, from, from Calvary, this offer that will give them a full life. 
we can live for the souls of men and women. We can. Now, here's what I want you to see. This is so powerful. Just follow this. Watch this. Jesus found his purpose in his cross. And look at these verses a minute. Let's just read through a handful of verses here. Jesus found his purpose in his cross. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. John, 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. That's, again, his purpose. Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it again. There's his purpose, that definite plan. John 18, 37, Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And Christ came to tell people what the truth is. Pretty interesting thought when you think about it. He came to tell people what the truth was and and that constituted again more than just words. But he had to demonstrate it on the cross. The truth, the depth of his love. There were some words that could not fully communicate the truth of God. We want to tell the world today the truth of God. Sometimes it takes more than just our words. It takes our surrender. John 12, 27, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, here's his purpose, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus found his purpose on the cross. What does that mean to you and me? The point is when he surrendered to his cross, he found his purpose highest purpose, his deepest meaning in life. Here's what it means to you and me. Jesus found his purpose in his cross, and um, guess what? Jesus has given you your own cross. And you will find your purpose, the hope of purpose in this life, a meaning, a joy, a fulfillment, a satisfaction you could never have imagined when you surrender to your own cross. And I don't know what it looks like for each one of us. We're all wired differently. We're all shaped differently. We're all, we all are unique in the way God has made us and where God has put us. And, but the reality is we all have our very own cross. In fact, it tells us that back in the book of Matthew. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Pretty powerful stuff. Pretty powerful stuff. Our trust in God's offer fills up our emptiness. When I simply trust the offer that God makes from the cross, when I simply trust the life that he's offering me, when I trust the worship that he's offering me and the hope that he's offering me, what an amazing thing. When I trust the offer God has for me, when I live his life, worship him only and take up my cross, when I surrender on that level, my empty life will be truly Jesus has the last word on surrender he shows us on the cross what surrender looks like he tells us why it is so important 
It is central to the gospel. It is central to our salvation on his end and on our end as we have to surrender to him. Wave the white flag and stop trusting ourselves. Let me leave you with this story here. In October of 1781, General Cornwallis marched his British troops into Yorktown. The patriots to the south had wreaked havoc on his redcoat army, and he was hoping to rendezvous with the British Navy on Chesapeake Bay. American and French troops, however, anticipating Cornwallis' plan, pounded them with cannon fire while the French fleet cut off escape by sea. The British found themselves trapped. Thomas Nelson, the then governor of Virginia and signer of the Declaration of Independence, was fighting with the patriots, firing the cannons in Yorktown. Gathering the men, he pointed to a beautiful brick home. That is my home, he explained. It is the best one in town. And because of that, Lord Cornwallis has almost certainly set up the British headquarters inside. And he told the American artillerymen to open fire on his own house. They did. As the story goes, the very first cannonball shot at Mr. Nelson's house sailed right through the large dining room window and landed on the table where several British officers were eating. It is one thing for a man to talk about freedom. It is quite another to destroy his own home to help make that freedom a reality. Nelson understood, however, that to hold on to his current life would mean forfeiting the life he was so desperately seeking. A life of true freedom would cost him the stuff of his present life. It was a small price to pay. On October 19, as the British troops surrendered, the Redcoat Band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. The song was apt. The world's greatest superpower had just been defeated by an army that couldn't afford to put shoes on its soldiers' feet. But how can you thwart an army willing to sacrifice everything they currently have for something infinitely better waiting on the other side? That's the example of Christ who surrendered it all because of the glory that awaited him in heaven. Where, what, or how do you need to surrender to God this morning? Is there an area in our life, and we all have areas, we need to wave the right flag and say, okay, I give up. I surrender to your will your authority, your plan. How does God's love bring you to a place of deeper surrender? What a great question. We think about how we need to surrender. How does the fact that God loves us so desperately, how can that love encourage my deeper surrender? And then what specific rights do you need to surrender to God this morning? Or in in another relationship or on the job or wherever it might be. What specifically would God say today? I want you to lay down your rights so that you can glorify me, follow the example of Christ. And how could a deeper surrender bring you a fuller life? How can a deeper surrender to God this morning bring you a fuller life? And if we just dwell on that question, what an amazing question indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the words of Jesus on surrender and how he just shows us the silence of surrender, to just, to not argue, to not argue with you, to not argue with others, to not fight back, to not defend ourselves, or may, but to simply surrender to your will, to surrender to your agenda, to surrender to your authority, to surrender our rights. And to simply receive the offer that you're making us from the cross of a personal relationship with you, that you will give us your life for the worship that you will offer us, that we can worship one who is truly worthy of our worship, who can bring us security. And then just the purpose that you give us as we surrender and take up our cross and follow you out into the world. Lord, I pray today this message hits us all in a unique place. In Jesus' name.